All right, welcome back to FYI, the For Your Institution podcast presented by Mongoose. Uh, I'm your host, Gil Rogers, and this is, I guess, um, continuing coverage of the consistently changing situation when it comes to the uh, delays with the FAFSA and its impact on enrollment managers. Um, I'm lucky enough to have Brad Barnett um, on the podcast again. Um, Brad joined a, a, a few weeks ago or a couple months ago now at this point to uh, talk about uh, financial aid strategies. And we, we, we talked about the new FAFSA uh, a little bit as well. And so as a as a follow on to our uh, to our recent podcast featuring Emily Coleman from HAI Analytics, I'm lucky to have Brad come on um, and talk about uh, some boots on the ground type scenarios. So we've got the consultant that's working with schools, and now we've got a representative from a school, right? So Brad, I'd love for you to uh, kind of reintroduce yourself to the folks who might might have missed our prior podcast, um, and then we can kind of hop in from there. Sure. Yeah. Great to be back. So thanks for having me back, Gil. I'm Brad Barnett, Associate Vice President of Access and, and Enrollment Management and Director of the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships at James Madison University. Sorry, I have to take a breath when you say my title. I was, I was going to say, do you, get, do you get paid by the letter in your title? Because that that would be really cool if you did. Just yeah. add a zero for each letter. <laughs> do that. I'm going to I'm gonna start a petition. <laughs> if it only worked that way. I'm a state employee. They give us long titles, but you know, that's it. Hey, that's good. But responsibility, influence, all those fun things. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. So let me uh, let let's dive right into the topic du jour, right? And uh, uh, for and if you've been living under a enrollment management rock, um, the challenge uh, that institutions are facing right now, I'll I'll give the high level summary of what I'm seeing, and then you fill in the blanks and let me know if I'm off base. Is you know clearly there are challenges this cycle uh, with respect to. First, the FAFSA was delayed for families, so that's going to be ha having an impact. And we've seen data recently um, on, you know, on filing rates. Then getting data to the institutions has uh, been delayed, and so there's going to be timing issues with respect to packaging students. And, and most recently, I think it was two days ago when this podcast is being recorded, um, the government has outlined, well, we're going to give some assistance to institutions and and outline some ways that some, you know, rules they're going to waive and things that they're going to, uh, you know, you know, less less um, students being targeted for confirmation and all that sort of fun stuff. Um, and so obviously this is a, a an interesting time to say the least um, for enrollment managers um, and financial aid leadership. So Brad, from, from your purview, how are things going? What are what are you, what's on your mind, and um, what did I miss in my summary of what's happening? First of all, what a loaded question to start with. How are things going? Um, yeah, it's it's interesting to say the least. You know, we're all still really anxious to get to twenty five twenty six and just put this implementation year behind us. I don't think that sentiment has changed at all. Um, how it's going though is the clock is just it's just ticking and the calendar is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So I think you're, you're seeing schools are feeling some sense of pressure to uh, to make sure our systems are working, to make sure things are getting tested, to get these FAFSAs in. You know, there's roughly 17 million FAFSAs filed every single year. And I think the last data we saw on how many FAFSAs have currently been filed are is somewhere between three and a half and four million, depending on what, what day of the wow. week. You know. yep. So we're still shy of all the FAFSAs that are actually going to be filed as the year progresses. And we're all really concerned about how we're going to get this data in our system to get our first year class. So what are some of the, what are some of the things that institutions are doing? In, it, Cause you can't just sit on your hands and wait, right? There's, there are methods that you could use and there's communications that should happen. What are some of the things you're doing? What are some of the things your colleagues are, are talking about? Yeah, it, you know, the, the thing we're really doing is trying to communicate. And this is one of those situations where you really can't over communicate. You know, we mm -hmm. are reaching out to every student who has applied for admission at JMU and their family. You know, we have early action and we have regular decision. We're not an early decision school. So we have already communicated to all of our early action admits and their family members twice. We've communicated to all the students who applied for regular decision and their family members twice. We're communicating with the JMU campus at large, letting them know what's going on. And here are some talking points, because we also know in this period where students are trying to determine where they want to go to school, 
they're not just talking with us. They're talking with our academic colleagues on mm -hmm. other parts of campus. We're talking with admissions or they're talking with the registrar's office, you know, student affairs. So we want to make sure that they have some good talking points to, to reassure students that we will get FAFSA data as soon as we get it. We will uh, communicate with them regarding their preliminary awards. And in the meantime, we're suggesting students use our net price calculator. And, mm -hmm. and every school has a net price calculator. Some are more robust than others, but it's a great place where we can send students to get some sense of what things might look like once we start getting fast. Yep. Data. Yep. Yeah, and I think that's one of the one of the items Emily recommended on our prior podcast was, you know, you, you got to use huge caveats, big, bold red letters. You know, these are estimates. These are, you know, to but it, it's all subject to verification. Right. And um, I think it's very similar in a sense of when we think about what institutions are do would do to, you know, collect SAT scores from high schools. Right. And they when they would get it on their transcript and then still need the score report from the college board, those sorts of things where you know, can, we can we can take iterative steps to get information that we need to to help move the process along and then kind of verify those things later and if that helps get students information to to be feel like they're uh, being responded to and being supported because i i can imagine there's scenarios where you know we, when we when we talked about this when you were on the podcast prior was you know that you've got current families who have been through this process before and this is going to impact them in one way and we've got first year families who this is kind of the first thing they've ever done. And now looking back at that conversation, it's like, well, hopefully they don't have this experience ever again. Uh, but now, but they, they, they don't know per se that it's the federal government's situation. They know it's, they're not getting data or they're not getting information from the school that they've applied to. And sure, you know, we can, it, we, we can kind of try to deflect that situation, but really it's, it's the institution who needs to be responsive and supportive, right? Yeah. And, and we're all trying to do that. I think the blessing of this, if there is a blessing or a silver lining is, is to your question or kind of point, we are all in this together. So the one thing is for most of the students who are looking at schools, they're getting the same kind of messages from most of us, which is we don't mm -hmm. have your FAFSA data. There's, there's nothing we can tell you right now regarding your aid eligibility, yep. but we've got this really cool net price calculator that'll give you some sense if you can answer a few questions. If you can hang on with us, we'll get you the information as yeah. soon as we get it from the feds. So they're hearing that from most schools, you know, the the outliers, and, and I call them outliers in, in my mind because it's a smaller subset of schools who use the CSS profile. You know, those are those institutions are getting out need based financial aid offers because they're not relying on the FAFSA. Mm -hmm. They have another tool, another application so they can put merit awards on the table. They can also put need based awards on the table. Those of us who are FAFSA dependent, well, we're getting our merit based awards out. Everything need based is just on hold. Mm -hmm. So if a student is comparing six schools and all those six schools just use the FAFSA, they should be getting a pretty similar message from all of them. Discover future applicants, delight enrolled students, and amplify fundraising performance with our Cadence Engagement Platform's live chat and chatbot solutions. Designed exclusively for higher ed by higher ed professionals, Cadence helps you engage your audiences with the perfect balance of AI and personal connection. We leverage proactive outreach and anticipate common roadblocks, knowing the most significant decisions often start with the smallest conversations. Our powerful AI ensures instant support and is smart enough to know exactly when to hand off to a staff member. And if nobody is available, it allows for easy follow-up. Effortlessly integrated with your website, we proudly feature an industry-leading 85% self-service rate. It's never been easier to make every message count. Yeah, and, and chances are, if there's, you know, I, I was talking to a colleague about this yesterday, the, you know, the, in the sales world, right. The first, the first person, the first sales rep to respond to someone who's doing outreach and research 90% of the time, they, they, they close the deal because they were the first one to respond first one out there. And that's the way college search worked for decades, right. Was first in the mailbox. We got the, we got the list from, from the college board or ACT or NRCCUA and Quora now. Right. And we were the first one in their mailbox. So we're going to be first on their mind. I don't know if, the financial aid package coming first apply those rules apply from an from a response perspective because if 
if a student has applied to six schools or they're in, accepted into six schools and they get there and one of the schools they've applied to uses the CSS profile there and the other five are communicating well with them about the issues with the FAFSA. I don't think they're going to just hop to that one school because they got the aid package, right? They need to, they need to be able to evaluate it against something, right? Yeah, I think that that's a pretty fair statement for for what we're dealing with with those few schools who are sending out need based information off of the profile. Um, I will say though, we are feeling a bit more of the the race to May first this year. So you could see a situation where schools that are 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 more readily to respond as soon as we start getting FAFSA information. Their systems are working. Their packaging policies are in place. They can start generating aid offers. Those schools have the ability to do that. Um, may have more an advantage over some of those schools who simply don't. Systems mm -hmm. don't work. Things are very manual. They're really behind the eight ball. May 1st is going to be creeping up. So we are concerned just industry-wide that there could be a subset of schools who almost won't be part of that conversation of where is the student going to go to school because they're going to get stuff out so late or so close to May 1st. Mm -hmm. Students could get anxious. They could start making decisions. Mm -hmm. on a handful of offers that have already come in before some schools even have the opportunity to kind of get a seat at the table. Yeah. That's a compressed timetable that's really creating some stress and consternation for everyone. Yeah. So I, I guess let's talk about what those institutions might consider doing because you're not going to necessarily be able to revamp your entire financial aid process again overnight. Yeah. Right. And so you kind of know that that's going to happen because you know, you know, your systems um, you know, I, I think back to years ago, I was uh, working with a school that they, they were one of those institutions It happens every cycle that they accidentally sent the admit letter to the people who had incomplete applications. Oh, yeah. right? And so that happens all the time. Perfect CRM platforms, you know, slate yep. is, is perfect, but somehow it still happens. They, the, the, the VP of enrollment at that institution, you know, kind of turned, you know, lemonade out of lemons with the situation because it was, you know, students who had, who had incomplete applications got those notifications, right? And so the admissions counselors had to work very directly and quickly to get in touch with those students, help them. Most, you know, this is a tuition-driven private school, so most of those students were admittable anyway, but it turned them into admissions counselors again and mm -hmm. not, not application processors, right? And so I feel like this is that lemonade out of lemons scenario, you know, silver lining, like you mentioned, where... We, we have to focus on get, being in touch and communicating well with students. We can't just let the system run. We have, to, we have to be helping them and supporting them. And so for those institutions whose package might be arriving later because the, their systems are not up to snuff, they still have some control over how they communicate, the cadence of their communication, the quality of their communication. And that's got to have some impact on the student's desire to wait to get that, that final package. It should. Yeah. I mean, this is, there's going to be a lot of reassuring, you know, we're, we're gearing up for one of our major freshman recruitment programs where early action students who had been admitted and their, their families all come out on campus for a day and uh, there's academic programming, there's student affairs program. There's a programming all over campus. We usually do a few workshops. We meet with parents and generally speaking, we're talking about the financial aid offer they've already received. And just helping them work out some of the finer details, whether or not JMU is an affordable institution for them. We're having discussions that this year, we're going to have no aid to offer them or show them, yet we're still going to staff. And, and our conversations are, we need to be staff. We need to be here because we're just going to be doing a lot of reassuring. Mm -hmm. We're going to be doing a lot of hold handing, hand holding and just telling people we get it. We understand that you're frustrated, that we can't give you a number. We know you know, this is why as soon as we get information, we're going to give it to you. So I think it's it's on us as institutions to try to be as reassuring to some of these students and parents who are looking for a place to go to school next year, mm -hmm. that we get it's a complex time. We're here to help. We're not ignoring you. Right. These are the things we're dealing with. So the communication strategy is very different this year from what it has been in prior years. You know, in prior years, it's your communication strategy is you're making offers and then you're communicating with people and follow up to your offers. Mm -hmm. This year, you're doing a lot of communication before you even have the ability to make an offer, just yep. reassuring people that an offer is eventually going to come. Right, right. And I think that that's the, the, the opportunity, again, to kind of reframe where 
that human connection comes in and supporting students through that process because they said the handholding should have been happening all along. Now it has to happen. There's no choice. Um, and if there's one thing most people can agree on is the federal government is hard to deal with in these situations. And so you can at least bond as humans and make make jokes about how it's it's the government's fault, right? <laughs> so we have we it's have low hanging fruit. Yeah, that that's so low hanging fruit. But yes, we can all bond. There, over there's the punching bag. The punching well. bag is is the feds, right? So we can <laughs> blame blame them, blame the government. <laughs> Yeah. So, so um, you, you know, one of the things Emily mentioned when I had, when I had her on talking uh, is, you know, all, and this is the, I guess this is going to be the newest wrinkle to the higher ed admissions enrollment hype machine, right? There's always the, the stress everybody out about the process and, you know, media coverage and news coverage and, you know, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. Are people panicking that you're talking to, or is it more of a kind of a thoughtful, methodical type of approach, or is it somewhere in the middle? Uh, no, there's people all over the spectrum. There, there's people who are in full on panic mode. There's people who are more methodical and there's folks who are just kind of, look, it is what it is. And we're just going along with it. And we're going to have some strategy and we're going to deal with the outcome when the outcome comes and, and we'll make this thing work. Um, you know, we're all human beings. You know, there's, mm -hmm. you know, over 30,000 financial aid professionals in this country, um, more than that. And, and we're all just dealing with it as best we possibly can to try to help all these prospective students. Um, so it is interesting when you talk to colleagues because everyone's kind of at a little different place. We are trying to to temper some of the frustration as best we can because the reality is we still have to do something. Mm -hmm. You can only gripe yeah. and complain so much before you have to figure out a strategy and you have to determine how you're going to help these students. Um, because there could be, depending on how we handle this, you know, we're worried that there could be kind of a lost class of low-income first-generation students who get right. so frustrated and turned off by this process and they can't get through this process, maybe they don't even go to college next year. And if they don't go to college after high school, will they ever come back? Mm -hmm. and, and those are questions that we don't have answers to, but we know that as an industry, we need to do our best to keep those people engaged um, so they don't give up Yeah, because it is a frustrating process right now. There is no way to sugarcoat that. It yeah. is frustrating. Thoughtfully nurture applicants, personalize retention efforts, and exceed fundraising goals with our Cadence Engagement Platform's text messaging solutions. Designed exclusively for higher ed by higher ed professionals, Cadence helps you engage your audiences with the perfect balance of AI and personal connection. We leverage an intuitively designed interface and easy to use texting templates so you can have targeted conversations or scale up to expand your reach. Our powerful smart messaging can respond automatically, exactly how you would. And to measure progress, track your campaigns with unparalleled reports and analytics. Effectively meet your community where they are as we proudly feature an industry-leading 95% read rate within three minutes. It's never been easier to make every message count. Yeah. And, and you bring up a good point about like, if you think about these students and I'm, I'm kind of having one of these aha moments about this, right. Where the, and, and not in a good way, unfortunately, uh, but the, you know, the, the students who are kind of coming into this process this year for the first time are also students who were negatively impacted by remote education and the challenges during COVID. Right. And so now we're dealing with a class of students who are going to have academic preparedness issues. They're going to have social adjustment anxiety issues. And now they're having this financial aid process that's going to push them back in in this, you know, it, and so it's a it's a, a really tough position to be in for the for the students and their families, having been the kind of the class that like went through that whole situation. And, you know, when I talked with with Emily a couple, or last week when we, we had her, her on from the admit from the financial aid officer's perspective. You know, when we look at the data, we look at the numbers and our models and the impact of, of different scenarios, you know, COVID had its own outliers. This will now have its own outliers. But when you go down a level and actually think about the students and the and the human beings, this is a this is a hard situation for them to navigate through. Uh, yeah, thanks for helping me to feel better. I appreciate <laughs> this counseling session on, uh, on uh, <laughs> I mean, you're you're a hundred percent right. I mean, the the complexities that are involved in this, they're deep. It's not a it's not a simple issue. You know, and and when you talk to Emily and, and others and we just look at our metrics anyway, we're doing the, you know, we all have our metrics and our tools that we use to evaluate packaging policies and how much money we can get give students and what our yields are going to be. All that math 
Well, I won't say all, but a lot of that math kind of got thrown out the window with a new FAFSA anyway, yep. because yep. we were dealing with a new SAI, not an EFC. We were dealing with new applicants, new L8 eligibility. So all of our old modeling really wasn't 100% applicable to the new FAFSA anyway. So then we were all trying to build new modeling tools to, to try yep. to determine as best we can how we can help students in a FAFSA that we've never actually processed. Well, now you add on the complexities of kicking the can down the road and making it so late to actually get FAFSA data and so late to actually get aid offers to students. And that's a whole nother level of complexity that we're sitting back saying, how do you model what's going to happen now? Mm -hmm. Because it was different under a time period when you thought you were at least going to get FAFSAs at a reasonable time frame. Right. And you could then still react and have a little bit of time to make some adjustments. Now we pretty much have to have things set before we get the FAFSAs in place because we won't have as much time to react and we're just going to go straight into processing mode. Well, well, they say diamonds are forged under pressure, right? And so hopefully- yeah, man, there's going to be <laughs> one big diamond by the time we're done. <laughs> one big diamond. So I yeah, so to address the the concerns of let's let's look at the spectrum of people, the people who are like, oh, we're going to be fine. We're, we're not going to worry about them. This podcast is not for them, right? This is for the 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 panic spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. you, you see more of the middle of the road. We're going to work through this. We're going to manage through it kind of. So as a middle of the road, we'll manage through it, even keeled person. What is your advice to the panickers on the on your, your colleagues that are, are looking at this process like deer in the headlights? Yeah, so there, there's a few things. One is is make sure that you have a community of other financial aid folks around you. You cannot do this alone. You know, there there's Slack channels. There's there's state, national, regional associations. There's people to reach out to. Most folks are are reaching out to people and have some some uh, other financial aid colleagues to kind of commiserate with and walk them through this. Um, the second thing is is ensure that you are communicating with your leaders on your campus. Everybody needs to know what's going on. They need to know the challenges. Don't try to hide any of this. They need to know the struggles. They need to know some of the issues. Um, hopefully you're having those conversations. If not, it's, it's really time to have those. Um, and then the last thing I would say is if you need resources, depending on your school, you probably saw that the Secretary of Education made an announcement and it, it's gone public now about the $50 million that's going to be available to help some under-resourced schools and they're working with nonprofits like NASFA um, to try to get some either federal assistance or maybe some financial aid professionals who have the ability and capacity to help other schools to be able to provide some assistance to some of these lower resource schools, the ones we were talking about earlier, who may just be way behind the A ball on being able to react to this. So, so follow the kind of the instructions and the guidance that you saw out in that to look for some assistance and to ask for some help sooner rather than later. Because if we can find other aid professionals or somebody else who can drop in and give you a little bit of time to help figure out this, then it's going to allow you to react better once right. we actually do start getting FAFSAs. Um, so there is some resource help available. It'll help some schools. It won't help all schools. Yeah. Um, it's not available for all schools. You know, the schools who are well-resourced, this is not for them. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a good population of schools who are under-resourced and they really need some help. So now... We're seeing there's some some responsiveness on behalf of the Department of Education, putting forth some money um, mm -hmm. with with a foundation in order to provide resources to to help right. those schools. Great, and so we for for that stressed out folks, we'll put links to a lot of the to resources and articles that may yeah. be of help in the episode notes. So take a look there um, and find that information. Um, and if and I guarantee you, whatever company sponsors the happy hour at the NASFA conference is going to have a very big bar tab to pay um, after this cycle. So good luck <laughs> to whatever company that is. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Brad, thank you so much again for um, reaching out to hop on and being a part of this conversation. Uh, if, if people want to get in touch with you and continue the conversation, um, what are the best ways to do that? Yeah, you can uh, you know email me at JMU. My email's on the JMU website. You can hit me up on LinkedIn. Those are probably two of the best places. I'm, I'm not huge, huge into social media. Fair enough. Uh, but I, I do the LinkedIn thing. Awesome. Well, appreciate your time, Brad. And we will see everyone next time on FYI. All right. See ya.